Hey, welcome back to the foyer in Kigali and to the heart of GAFCON. My name is Dominic Steele. It's great to have you with us. We are in the lunch break on day four. There's around 24 hours of this conference to go. And look, this conference, the GAFCON conference and all the associated Global South people here, they represent around 80 to 85 percent of the Anglican communion worldwide. And a dominant theme of the conference all around the place is how are we going to respond to the Church of England General Synod, the House of Bishops of the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury and my read of the conversations around the place is that there's been well a general sense amongst delegates here of profound disappointment in the Church of England and so I thought I'd actually ask three members of the Church of England General Synod in to come and talk to us about their experience both at the General Synod in England and the GAFCON conference now and so we've invited Jane Patterson and Debbie Buggs and Gabriel Chu to come and have a discussion with us and um, I don't know whether to start with the General Synod or start with here. Why don't we start with the fun bit? How has it been here this week? Uh, thanks for asking, Dominic. It's been amazing uh, being part of a worldwide um, family, um, family of many nations, every tongue and tribe, um, all united. It does feel like a taste of heaven, doesn't it? it? It certainly is a foretaste of heaven. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was great to worship at the cathedral on Sunday with um, fellow Christians in a different language and then to be here at the conference centre has been great as well. I've loved it, it's just shown that God's gospel has gone all the way throughout the world and we get to celebrate that even now before the new creation, so I love it. And I'm imagining, uh, and, and why I invited you on, is because, I mean, I was feeling for you guys <laughs> because I'm imagining every conversation you have with a stranger when they discover you're a member of the English General Synod, they're going to say, what is, am I right? <laughs> People are um, interested to listen. Um, they are sympathetic. I think understanding the nuances of how General Synod works is a challenge for folk who aren't there. So we think it's important, if we can, to explain what has actually happened. We appreciate there's a serious trajectory mm -hmm. um, ongoing in the Church of England but it hasn't happened just yet. Mm -hmm. That's right, it's been great to have opportunity over coffee to talk to people and explain the detail and, and the peculiarities of our situation. Um, one of the things I've loved is that um, even though we've talked about what's happened to General Synod, that's not where the conversation stayed. Uh, we've been praying, and uh, not just praying about General Synod, but they're asking about ministry for me back in Liverpool, and I'm sure in Sheffield and London, um, and rejoicing at what's going on there, um, because it's way more than just one issue, what you know, GAFCON is about, what Anglicanism is about, um, and so, yeah, I just want to celebrate that. Um, it's gone beyond just the General Synod sadness. Well, why don't we have a little wonder down that path for a minute. Tell us about the ministry of Christ Jesus in Liverpool that you're involved with, Gabriel. Uh, sure, I'll give you just a little snippet. Um, we've got a number of Farsi speakers who have come to know Jesus either back in Iran and have had to fle flee, um, uh, or they've actually, during their sort of refugee travels, um, have come to into contact with Christian missionaries in Athens um, or in France um, or even just in Liverpool um, and have come to know and trust Jesus. Um, and so, you know, it's been wonderful to have a taste of heaven there because we're, we're needing to, to, to minister to one another in different languages, in heart languages. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's just a little snippet of what's going to happen. So how's your Farsi? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, not good. <laughs> what about you? Um, in, in my church, we've been overjoyed to see people being baptized, professing faith, particularly from our Chinese speaking congregation, well, Mandarin speaking congregation. I'm a member of Christchurch Forward in Sheffield and for the last 20 years or more we've been committed along with other conservative evangelical churches to church planting and that's been a really positive thing for the gospel in Sheffield and indeed in South Yorkshire. Mm. Well, let's go back to General Synod and um, I mean just let's hear from you both emotionally and practically about, um, about what your General Synod response was. Um, we've started this end a few times. Why don't we start with you, Gabriel? Um, yeah, profound sadness, uh, because um, what we have is a gospel that saves. Um, and so moving away from Jesus and his goodness um, is, um, is, is moving on from the one thing that is the hope of all of England and the hope of the whole world. 
Um, and so um, seeing our, uh, our leaders who I, I believe are well-intentioned and wanting to love people, but missing out on the one who loves most. Um, and so it, it's very, very regretful, basically. For me, the initial shock happened before General Synod when the papers came out. So there was a Friday in January, um, the papers came out and I felt shocked and angry, angry that the bishops had almost taken us for fools. Everything was so finely nuanced, clear things were finely nuanced or other, things had been, other clear things had been ignored completely. So just reading through my heart sank. So, thank you. So following on from what Debbie said, I can clearly remember where I was on Friday the 20th of January when the papers were issued. I was about to get on a train to London to meet up with other members of the Evangelical Group on General Synod. And I was concerned, A, would I have time to read the papers before the meeting, B, understand what was being proposed, and C, know how to react. I was appalled by the lack of theology and doctrine in the bishop's response. And the moment I turned to the, um, the booklet of prayers of love and faith, I read the first prayer and thought, well, that represents a change in doctrine. Mm. So I know how to respond to that. Mm. I, I felt a sense of betrayal. I've spent 10 years on the Crown Nominations Commission uh, nominating diocesan bishops. I believe bishops should do what they are appointed to do, to do. Yeah. exactly, you know, to teach the truth and refute error. And you know, I mean, there has been a clear rejection of consecration vows. Yeah, yeah. That's how it seems. You know, we would want to say, I would want to say, you know, a small number of bishops have been courageous and have been willing to stand and vote against their brother and sister bishops, which takes you know, serious courage. It's an interesting point. Um, I've had a couple of conversations here, and it was Jay Bean from New Zealand who started us on it, and he pointed out that it was the bishops in the Church of New Zealand that led their denomination into sin in uh, Australia. Um, uh, the clergy and the laity both voted for orthodoxy uh, a few months ago in our general synod, but 12 votes to 10, the, bush, the bishops voted for revisionism. Uh, and in, in Wales and in England, it's been the bishops who's, who've who've led into sin. Now, um, Jay then made the statement to me, he said, I've been a bishop for a year and I've spent the least amount of time in the Bible in my ministry life. Because when I'm a church, of England, well, when I'm a church minister, I'm forced 12 hours a week <laughs> to be there um, working with the scriptures, work, translating the passage, thinking about the implications and I'm, I'm so caught up with problems and admin and I'm attempting to try and find compromises and, and really the job description is designed to weaken my faith. Yeah. Um, well, Mrs. Bishop Picker, <laughs> um, what do you, how do you respond to that? Um, well, I guess I would say I'm not the person who designs the job description, but we, there is serious talk about the challenges, yeah. and the challenges remain the same. You know, the top challenge in every Episcopal appointment is to preach the gospel and to grow the church, mm. and that is done to a variable extent. Mm. Now, um, the, I'm, I'm assuming that, well, I know, because I know that a number of English bishops watch our program. Um, what do you want to say to them about what the mood of this place is? I mean, they will read a statement tomorrow, but it, it's, it's perhaps more important for them to hear the groundswell of determination uh, that, you, that you've picked up across the board here. Well, so people are saying it feels like um, your mother, you've been harmed by your mother. I, it surprised me how much people looked to the Church of England to provide a clear lead. And of course, if our bishops are wanting unity at the expense of truth, they're not going to give a good lead. We need bishops who aspire to unity, but by building on the truth. Um, I mean, I echo everything that's been said in terms of the love of the wider Anglican communion for the Church of England. And what I've been most encouraged by is, and I wasn't sure if it would come about, 
which is their commitment to support um, Anglicans within the Church of England uh, to, to, to reform, renew, um, and love people in England. Um, so that's, you know, they, they love the Church of England. Um, it, it is incumbent on us um, to repay that love by sticking with Jesus. It's interesting that, uh, that sense of, the sense of the love also means, I think, a bigger emotional sense of disappointment and letdown. Yeah. I, I certainly th have seen that and heard that. You know, we are here in the minority mm -hmm. and we are aware um, that you know, the vast majority of the Anglican Communion worldwide is being faithful and um, seeing the primacy of the Word of God as, it's pass as mm. revealing the truth of who he is and the pattern for life. Mm. And you know, it seems as though the Church of England, in large part, is walking away from that, and that is very difficult. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed is um, uh, it would <laughs> seem to me that, um, I mean, even if Justin Welby and the House of Bishops repents, and we pray that that would be the case, it does feel like the train has left the station on the key leadership role for the Anglican denomination, moving from being something located in London to something that is somehow elected by a body of primates. It feels like that train has left the station. Well, certainly from what we heard yesterday... Um, oh, sorry, we're not allowed to talk about the statement. <laughs> we can, but we, but we, but we can talk about we can talk about what different primates have said. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we can talk about conversations in the halls, all that kind of thing. I would certainly say there is a, a very real sense in the auditorium that it, yeah, times are changing, and whether the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury as leader of the communion is appropriate or tenable now. Mm, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for coming to talk to us. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. It's been great to have you on, the, on our program. For Debbie, for Jane, for Gabriel, all members of the uh, Church of England, and we thank them for their co courage. You're watching the uh, Heart of GAFCON. My name is Dominic Steele. We're brought to you by anglicanaid.org.au.